have tried to conclude many times in my life that the Indian medical school system is so hostile to research that the thousands of brilliant physicians who join those places, they make sure that none of them is interested in research before they finish. But they got me into a tough place because CMC produced Gagandeep Kang and nurtured her, then I have to say, no, there must be something good about us. Uh, she is a very, very special person in the biomedical research space in this country uh, for numerous reasons. Uh, she's hugely intelligent, has a wonderful mind, which is her parents and her genome, so I give her no credit for it. But she deserves credit for numerous things. Enormous learning energy. You know, every two years she's better endowed intellectually in terms of skills, in terms of energy, in terms of passion, in terms of becoming more and more collaborative and growing prettier by the day as you must have realized. You know. So a person who evolves and is a very special person in that sense. Uh, she is selfless to the core. Uh, I have never heard her say no. And that is because she is driven by a purpose. A person who actually lives in the world of microbes, but actually cares about humans. And that caring is what drives her to be a truly collaborative person. There's a tremendous sense of purpose. She would like to see every disease conquered so that people live safer. And this driving force is what drives her to learn, what drives her to collaborate. Uh, she's prepared to lead, to follow, you name it, and she can switch into any role that is asked of her if it fits into that basic premise she has, which is, is this going to do good to our communities, to our societies? The other aspect that I find fascinating about her is the way she nurtures young people, the tremendous nurturing, uh, gives 100% of herself as an example in terms of giving them freedom, flexibility, guidance, resources, you just name it. And so she is that teacher, mentor, par excellence, in truly outstanding. I think she's a great example as a woman for India. You know. uh, I have I remember John Rohde used to tell me a story that when Mr. Bill Gates interv interviewed him for Rick Klosner's job. So he said, what will you, this was before Rick joined, and he said, what will you do with my resource? And he said, I will invest it all on nurturing women, the rest of it all we solve. And of course, you can imagine with Bill, the interview lasted five minutes and he was out of the room and he just men mentioned that story to me. And I think Gagandeep is an outstanding example of what if we nurtured the 50% of women in this country, I would say even the United States would have a tough time running with us. And that won't happen unless we have leaders like her, who role models like her that will inspire the women of this country. She's enough of a man to inspire actually all of us to, to excel and to serve. This combination is there are lots and lots of clever people in this world. But the number who are clever but who also care is in short supply. And she is an outstanding example of that blend. You know. But her raw courage She's not afraid of taking people on when the cause is right. She's not worried about consequences. And that again is a trait which is not very common in India. With centuries of foreign rule, we become masters at communicating in a language that creates the least turbulence but solves the least problems. But she has this characteristic of speaking out and leading up front, she doesn't hide behind the curtain when she knows there are people who will be unhappy with what she's saying, but they need to be said. You know. So very unusual characteristic f 
for an Indian, for an Indian woman. And probably she is one of our best known biomedical scientists in India, overseas in the biomedical community because her energy is unfathomable. I don't know where it comes from. My guess is from extreme calorie restriction, but it could also be something else. So I would say for me, among the people that I truly admire for what they stand for and what they are willing to give to the development of Indian science, India's public health, uh, India's regulatory systems, uh, breeding a new generation of young people in this country, she is a truly outstanding leader. And it's a privilege, Gagandeep, to have you with us. And we look forward to your great lecture, which always is wonderful. Uh, I forgot a lot of beautiful things that came to my mind when I saw you were looking a little extra pretty that day in Jipmer. Uh, but uh, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, sir, for that very generous introduction. I always feel like I'm a wonderful person when I hear Dr. Bhan speak. So, the reality is, of course, that I'm rude and stubborn and just keep going. So I thought what I would talk about, so I work on enteric infections and most of what I do or have done has been around rotavirus and rotavirus vaccines. But I figured that this community was one that knows more than enough about rotavirus, so I went back to an older oral vaccine that we've been doing a little bit of work with. Now, when I talk about doing work with polio, what usually happens is people tell me, you know, we don't have polio in India anymore. Why do you want to work on that? And I thought in a very simplistic sort of way that polio is a vaccine where you actually have a correlate of protection. And maybe I learn lessons from that that I could potentially apply to oral rotavirus vaccines that also don't work very well in developing countries. As usually happens to me, I was wrong, but I'm going to tell you about some of the things that we've been doing. The way I've structured this talk is moving forward. What's going to be happening with the global and Indian plans for polio and then looking at the recent studies that we have been doing with polio vaccines and end with what I think the key takeaways are. Now, polio is kind of front and center of global vaccination efforts. It's been declared a programmatic emergency by the World Health Assembly in 2012. And in response to that declaration, the polio eradication and end game strategic plan was developed and was accepted by the World Health Assembly in 2013. Now, a lot of resources were put behind that, and the end game's major objectives were considered to be virus detection and interruption, routine immunization strengthening and OPV withdrawal containment and certification, and then planning for the legacy of polio. Now, when it came to virus detection and interruption, we threw huge resources at it. We knew some of what we were doing, but we also didn't know a lot of reasons why doing lots of oral polio immunization around the country was working. Where we are today is that the timeline stretched a little bit. We didn't see the last wild polio virus case between 2014 and 2015, but we are going ahead with plans to introduce IPV and for OPV to withdraw. If you look at the data for last year, and in red what you have is the wild poliovirus type 1 cases. There were 72 of them. 
Circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus 1 was 19 and circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus 2 was 9. We are left now with only two countries that are endemic for polio and these are Pakistan and Afghanistan which have themselves made great strides during 2015. In October 2015, at the SAGE meeting, a lot of very important decisions were made. Dr. Arora, who is a member of SAGE, was at that meeting and leads these efforts. And basically what SAGE did was review the progress that had been made and decided that the conditions for OPV2 withdrawal had been largely met, not completely, but largely and that it was possible to go ahead and this was going to be important because the risks from having circulating vaccine derived poliovirus 2 emerging were greater than the risks of possibly having an outbreak. So the recommendations derived from the fact that in September 2015, it was certified that while poliovirus type 2 had been eradicated worldwide, and in fact type 3 hadn't been seen for a while, that all the readiness criteria were met, and in April 2016, we are expected to switch from using trivalent OPV to bivalent OPV. And we are expected by that time to introduce one dose of IPV. Now what does this switch mean? If you look at the countries that are in yellow here, these are the countries that have only OPV in their schedules. In blue are the countries that have IPV also in their schedules, so a combined schedule. In grey, the countries that have only IPV. So what we are talking about is a two week period in which we are going to colour the entire map blue or grey. And that is a huge effort for countries to do together. Now in terms of what India has been doing, the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation recommended introduction of an IPV dose at 14 weeks in 2013. The implementation of this recommendation was begun in 2015 but is not yet countrywide. And there have been issues with supply, but as a level one country, we will get the supply that we need. There was a pilot of the TOPV to BOPV switch in Assam, which went very well. There are two national immunization days planned. One has already taken place in January, and there will be another one in February. And there will be a nationwide trivalent to bivalent switch that will happen in line with WHO recommendations. Now all this is the result of tremendous efforts in India. So if you look at what's happened with oral polio vaccines in industrial countries where they were used, the oral polio vaccines wiped out polio with ease. However, in India, it didn't seem to matter the number of doses you gave. It was very, very difficult to get rid of polio. We introduced national immunization days to provide supplementary immunization to children in the 1990s. We formed the National Polio Surveillance Project in the late 90s, and then we introduced subnational immunization days. It's estimated that some of our children were getting about 40 doses of oral polio vaccine. Not only were we then looking for seroconversion and finding that rates were low for children who actually had immunization recorded on their cards, we also found that when wild polio virus was still circulating in India, there were children who had received more than 10 or more doses of OPV and they were still shedding wild polio virus. Now if you look at what happens in industrialized countries, now if you give a child OPV, they make an immune response to 1, 2 and 3, the three viruses in the vaccine. After a little while, the response drops you lose antibodies, maybe about a log, but you're still protected and after that it stays stable. 
When you look at what happens with IPV in industrialized countries, you see a very similar sort of picture, an initial great response and then the neutralizing antibodies come down but stay stable over a long time. If you look at fecal IgA, what you see with OPV given to children, these are children who had previously received two doses of OPV when they got given a third dose. They boost and it persists for a little while, but it does come down. However, if you have children who have not received OPV and they get just IPV, they really don't make a lot of poliovirus specific IgA. Now, how then do you study intestinal immunity? Now, there are really no good biomarkers for mucosal immunity for polio. There are lots of things that have been tried. IgA is difficult to measure. Cell-based assays are difficult when it's children that you're studying and large volume samples are hard to get. So really, challenge studies have been the gold standard, but when you looked at countries that had been using the vaccine for a very long time, it was interesting that in a systematic review, there were 31 studies, but none of them had actually examined shedding after challenge in relation to the time since the last vaccination and certainly none in developing countries. We did have data, however, that told us that after a while, mucosal immunity does wane. So whether people have been exposed to OPV, which is supposed to induce good intestinal immunity or wild poliovirus, after a while when they are challenged, they do shed. And this is data that was both from children and from older adults who presumably had been naturally exposed. We also knew from a very small study in the Netherlands that if IPV is given to children who have previously received OPV, then you can boost the IgA response, but if they have previously received IPV, you won't get that. So based on that, we decided to design a study and our hypothesis was that if we gave a single supplemental dose of IPV to children who had been vaccinated with OPV at least six months previously, we would be able to reduce shedding on challenge. So we had objectives that were basically to look at the response to mucosal immunity in these children and we wanted a period of at least six months previously because we wanted to know what would happen to children when they were between national immunization days. So the way the study was set up was we had children who had received at least five doses of OPV, had a six month gap from that. Then we gave them IPV and looked for neutralizing antibodies. After 28 days, we challenged them with MOPV1, looked for neutralizing antibodies, which presumably would be boosted with the IPV dose, and we looked for shedding by RT-PCR. So seven days later, after the challenge, again, we looked at whether these kids were shedding. And here we had a control arm where we did no intervention initially, but challenged them with MOPV1. We then converted this into a second arm where we challenged them twice and looked at whether this MOPV1 had made them respond or not. So if we look at the data from that, the primary analysis was between this control group and these children who had received IPV. And the secondary analysis was between IPV and OPV in these children. So if you look at the setup of this slide, this is comparing children who got bivalent OPV and IPV. And what you're looking at here is the titers. So polio is done by dilution, so less than 8, 8, 16, 32, etc. And this is a cumulative number of children who had less than that titer. 
So essentially what it means is if you are pushing out this side, you are making a good immune response. And if you look at IPV, you can see that the IPV induces a good response against poliovirus 1, 2 and 3. In the children who got bivalent OPV, you would not expect to see much of a response against 2 because that is not in the vaccine. But we saw actually a fairly small response for 1 and 3 as well. So, this was serum neutralizing antibodies induced by IPV and bivalent OPV. We also looked at shedding and these are the results on shedding at one week after challenge. So, here you have children who are challenged with bivalent OPV which contains PV1 and 3. This is the response for poliovirus 1, this is the response for poliovirus 3. And what you can see here is that there is a reduction in the IPV versus no vaccine group on day 7, which is better for PV3 than for PV1. So, this data was the study was done in 2013 and was published in 2014. And shortly after that, another study was published. Our children were aged between 1 and 4 years, so children who are still receiving immunization in the national immunization days. But there was another study that was done by NPSP that kind of bracketed the age groups that we were studying. And they had children who were 6 to 11 months of age, 5 years and 10 years of age. Now, if you look here, the children who were 10 years of age are the children who are not included in the national immunization days. So, they are not boosted twice a year by oral polio vaccination. And if you look at what happens on challenge at a comparable time point to the study that we did at 7 days, what you see here is that in the 10 year old children, IPV reduces the shedding much more than bivalent OPV, even though bivalent OPV does reduce uh, shedding as well. So, these data were communicated to WHO and then we went on to a, an extension study where we looked at the duration of the effect of IPV on polio shedding on challenge. Now, this was a study that had 300 children in each arm and what we wanted to see here was if you challenge 6 months after giving IPV or 12 months after giving IPV, what would you see? Would that effect that we had seen at 1 month persist for this long? So, these data were actually generated last week, so I did not have time to put them into figures. But what we see is that the effect of IPV persists. It is again better for poliovirus 3 than for poliovirus 1, where we see it only in the 6 month follow up. We do not see it when the IPV was given 12 months previously. Okay, so, switching tax now to another angle and this is to do with how do you improve oral vaccine performance. There are a lot of factors that have been described that occur I classify them as sort of at or after birth and factors at the time of immunization that can affect innate and adaptive responses to oral vaccines in low and middle income countries. There are a lot of them, but not all of them can be amenable to modification. So, if you look at what are possible practical interventions. You could try improving nutritional status, you could try supplementing, withholding breastfeeding has been done for both polio and rotavirus vaccines and found to not be a practical intervention. You can change the immunization strategy or you can change the vaccine by giving more doses or boosting, you can add adjuvants. And more recently, there has been an interest in environmental entropathy or environmental enteric dysfunction, 
which can potentially be treated. So, treat infections or decrease inflammation or try to modify intestinal microbiota. So, when thinking about it, we looked at what interventions had already been tested and zinc, vitamin A, withholding, breastfeeding, anti-malarials, anti-helminthics, probiotics had been tested. However, when we looked at antibiotics, those really had not been tested and we therefore designed the study to address the question whether treatment of concomitant infections would enhance the immune response to oral polio vaccines and we believe that repeated and early enteric infections would lead to poor vaccine performance either because you did not have replication or because you did not make a systemic immune response. So, in this study we screened children to look for poliovirus type 3 antibodies. We found children who had received at least 3 doses of oral polio vaccine, but were still negative for PV3 antibodies. We identified 750 children and then treated half of them with azithromycin. After 14 days, we challenged them with PV3, collected stool and blood and then 21 days later collected stool and blood again. We ran a number of different assays on the children. So, there are lots of interesting challenges about all the permissions we had to get for this study, but essentially we screened nearly 9000 children and we worked very, very, very hard for about probably 8 months and we found that after all of our work, the azithromycin made no difference whatsoever. The azithromycin did work because if you look at inflammatory markers in stool, myeloperoxidase, calprotectin and alpha 1 antitrypsin did come down. So, azithromycin suppressed at least gut inflammation. The plasma markers were unaffected. Azithromycin also resulted in a decrease in bacteria, a significant decrease in multiple bacterial species, but did not really affect viruses or parasites. Now, not only did the number of children who were excreting bacteria decrease, the amount of bacteria that they were excreting also decreased after antibiotic treatment. When we looked at children who were seroconverted versus those who did not seroconvert, we rediscovered an old fact. If you have enteroviruses in your stool, you would not respond to polio vaccine. Seriously big deal. We also went on to try to look at the microbiota and I am not going to show you all of the data, but essentially we found something that is kind of counterintuitive from what we know about microbiota so far and that was that responders had lower diversity at the time of vaccination. We also found that unusually younger children tended to respond better to vaccine than older children. So, the summary of this humongous amount of effort was that treatment with azithromycin worked to reduce pathogenic intestinal bacteria and inflammatory biomarkers, but it actually had no effect on response to oral polio vaccine. Now, children who did seroconvert after we gave them monovalent vaccine were younger, they were less likely to have enterovirus in their stool at the time of vaccination and had a less diverse microbiota. Coming finally to the third angle that I wanted to cover and that was interactions between vaccines and this really speaks to how different things are when you explore them in different parts of the world. When given together with oral rotavirus vaccine, the seroconversion to oral polio vaccine is unaffected. So, there have been studies from industrialized countries that show that with oral rotavirus and polio given together, the IgA seroconversion is lower for the first dose, but by the second dose there appears to be a catch up and there is no difference in seroconversion rates 
after a complete series of rotavirus vaccination. If you look at what happens to the polio response, this is data from Bangladesh and essentially nothing happens to polio responses if you give rotavirus vaccine together or separately or you give a placebo along with that. And when you give IPV or OPV, again responses to PV1, 2 and 3 were unaffected in South Africa. Similar data was seen for polio responses in the Rotavac study, where there was no difference in the polio antibodies in children who received either Rotavac or placebo. But if you look at what happens to oral rotavirus seroconversion, when we did studies without OPV with Rotarix, we saw a 58 percent seroconversion, sorry. And when you had Rotarix given with OPV, that had 27 percent seroconversion. If you look at Rotovac given without OPV, 89 percent seroconversion and Rotovac with OPV, 40 percent seroconversion. Now why does this happen? I do not really know. So in terms of key takeaways from all of these three studies, the mucosal immunity studies inform WHO's policies for travelers and for control of circulating vaccine derived poliovirus and wild type poliovirus outbreak. So what I have here for you is unpublished data from Nick Grassley's group and essentially when you have a period that is before a supplement, supplementary immunization activity and after what you see is that you see circulating vaccine derived poliovirus, you do an IPV and OPV SIA effort and subsequently you will see if at all only in the environmental sample no cases being seen. This was seen in Bono state in Nigeria, it was also seen in Yobe state in Nigeria. The one environmental sample that was positive here was actually exactly on the border of where the supplementary immunization activity had taken place. So this was for circulating vaccine derived poliovirus cases. A similar effect was seen in Pakistan where addition of IPV to the supplementary immunization activity resulted in a greater decrease in the number of cases. So this, the study that we did, did impact policy and we think that the new data that we have generated for 6 months and 12 months will also help support some of the strategies that have been developed for controlling vaccine derived poliovirus. Nonetheless, there is a lot that remains to be explored. We do not know whether suppressing inflammation over a longer period could put potentially improve take of oral vaccines. We do not know what microbiota related changes mean, are they cause, are they effect. I mean the microbiota is in the colon, your responses are in the small bowel. Rotavirus actually infects mature enterocytes, why does poliovirus interfere with the rotavirus response? You would think there would be enough surface of the gut for both of them to get in even though the poliovirus receptor is expressed on most human cells. Will rotavirus vaccines perform better in developing countries when IPV is introduced? We really do not know. So there is a lot that we still need to learn. This is a vaccine that worked without our necessarily understanding it, but there are other vaccines that are being developed. And we really need to be thinking about the kinds of clinical studies and vaccine trials we should be doing. There are a lot of new technologies that are available. Human studies are not easy, but they can be done and I think they now offer real opportunities to learn and to test. So I will 
stop there and just acknowledge the support that we have received from the Department of Biotechnology and the Gates Foundation. At CMC, I have, of course, this completely amazing team. Um, I'm usually not there, so somebody else does the work. They are probably way better at it than I ever could be. And we have good collaborators around the world. These studies were with Nick Grassley and Ed Parker at Imperial College, but on other studies we have had fabulous support from many collaborators around the world. Thank you.